Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the differential diagnosis of um, ptosis. And now I want to talk about uh, the surgical correction of ptosis. And our choice of, uh, as you guys recall, those who were with us two weeks ago, we sort of break ptosis up into those patients whose uh, third cranial nerve and whose levator muscle themselves are normal, but the attachment of the levator muscle to the eyelid, to the tarsal plate, which of course, as you know, is the levator aponeurosis, that is either stretched, pulled loose, thinned, weakened. In one fashion or another, the lid is sitting at the wrong height and yet there is still good levator function. So from down gaze to up gaze, we still have you know, 13, 14, 16 plus millimeters of excursion. That tells us that the levator muscle and the third nerve are functioning well, and the problem is mechanical. So if we have good levator function, there are basically two operations we talk about. We uh, talk about doing a mullerectomy, and this is my first choice in anybody who has a good response to topical neosinephrine drops where it lifts the lid to a good height. And if they have an inadequate response to neosinephrine, then is when I'll start talking about doing a levator aponeurosis advancement. And we're gonna demonstrate both those techniques today. If patients have uh, intermediate to good function, that would be from you know say six millimeters up to uh, 12 millimeters or so. At that range, I don't generally find that a mullerectomy is uh, reliable, and therefore I would do a levator aponeurosis advancement on this group of patients with intermediate to good function. Patients who have poor levator function, in my mind that's less than six millimeters, uh, I have two choices. If they show good brow elevation, so if they're trying to see out of that eyelid by raising their eyebrow, then a frontalis sling is a very good operation to elevate uh, the lid and yet still allow it to close reasonably well when they relax the eyebrow. If they do not recruit the, uh, the frontalis and the two situations we see that in are patients who have amblyopia where they have no desire for single binocular vision, they generally don't elevate their uh, frontalis. Uh, in them, uh, a frontalis sling is pretty ineffective. Or obviously, if a patient has a, a seventh nerve palsy or a selective palsy of the uh, temporal branch of the seventh nerve going to the levator or to the frontalis muscle, then they're not a good candidate for frontalis recruitment. And in those patients, we're generally going to do a super maximal levator resection where we go in, we not only cut out the levator aponeurosis, we also cut out a good amount of the levator muscle itself and then reattach the levator muscle to the tarsal plate. So again, this is the typical uh, exam that we'll see in somebody who has good levator function. We look at them and measure their excursion from down gaze to up gaze, and this patient has about you know, 13 or 14 millimeters of levator function. Uh, she's a very good candidate for uh, a, a mullerectomy if she responds to neosinephrine, if she does not, a very good candidate for uh, an aponeurotic advancement. Uh, Here's a patient who has uh, a uh, left-sided ptosis, which we can see here. And after neosinephrine, we see that the lid lifts up to a, to a very good height with a good contour. In that circumstance, a patient like this, I would do a, um, a mullerectomy uh, ptosis repair. So in those patients, we put a drop of 2.5% neosinephrine in. Again, I reserve this for patients who have good levator function, so that's generally 12 millimeters or better of levator function. If we get a excellent lid height and contour after that, then we'll plan to remove eight millimeters of conjunctiva in Mueller's muscle. Um, if they have an, uh, an inadequate response, but still some elevation, say they started out with an MRD one of one millimeter and they went to two and a half millimeters, but the opposite eye has uh, three and a half or four millimeters of MRD1, then I would take more Mueller's. Then I'll take uh, 10 millimeters or even 12 millimeters or sometimes even 14 millimeters of conjunctiva in Mueller's. But the concept is the same. We measure out the amount of, uh, of tissue that we wish to remove. We put a clamp across it and then we 
suture across the conjunctiva and Mueller's muscle just below our clamp. We then excise the clamp tissues and bring the sutures uh, from the posterior fornix, full thickness through the eyelid to exit through the eyelid crease. And we're going to demonstrate that now. Here's a patient. You can see she has a bilateral ptosis. Uh, she's really recruiting her frontalis on this side, uh, less so on this side, which suggests to me this is very likely her dominant eye. She's probably left eye dominant. Uh, that's not important for us in determining a mulorectomy, but as we'll see later on, it is important in determining uh, patients that we want to do a frontalis sling. But of course, there's no need to do a frontalis sling here because the patient has good levator function. So I put a drop of neosinephrine in and it lifted the eyelid to a good height. So that tells me I'm going to go ahead and do a mulorectomy. My first step in doing that is to pass a traction suture through the tarsal plate here at the lid margin. I usually use a 4-0 silk suture, uh, but any sort of suture will do. And I pass that through the lid margin. And that allows me to then evert the eyelid over a DeMar retractor. So I put a DeMar retractor on the back side and bring the eyelid up and over it, exposing the superior border of tarsus here. We can see a little bit of the, uh, the DeMar retractor shining through the eyelid and the palpebral conjunctiva and Mueller's muscle above that point. So step one is to avert the lid. Step two is I'm then going to put my calipers on half the amount of Mueller's muscle and conjunctiva I wish to resect. So in this case, if I'm planning to do an eight millimeter Mullerectomy, I will place my calipers on four millimeters and I will mark this point just proximal to the superior border of tarsus. So I'm gonna mark four millimeters between the superior border of tarsus, which is here, and back into the, uh, to the fornix. I do one, uh, at a point uh, sort of in the range of the medial limbus. And I mark a second point, again, four millimeters above the superior border of tarsus at the temporal limbus. And then I grasp these two points and I'm going to distract those so I can put a clamp across the eyelid uh, incorporating that tissue. Uh, this happens to be a uh, my preferred clamp, which is a spring-loaded uh, uh, clamp. It's not the standard Putterman clamp. It has a spring so that the when I release the clamp, it is it is automatically clamped. Its default position is to be closed on the tissues. In the Putterman clamp, one has to squeeze the clamp together and then push a little slide to lock it into place. But if you don't have either a Putterman clamp or a Geddes clamp, you can also just use two straight hemostats and you can clamp across just at the superior border of tarsus, incorporating that uh, measured tissue. And the reason we measure four millimeters here is we have two sides of this. We have from the superior border of tarsus to the, to the point we're grasping is four millimeters. And then the back side of it is another four millimeters. So in order to excise eight millimeters, I grasp at four millimeters and then clamp uh, the tissue. Once this tissue is incorporated within my clamp, I then am going to take a double armed, and I happen to use a double armed 6-0 plain gut suture. Uh, you can use uh, any sort of double armed suture that you wish as long as it's monofilament. You should not use a braided suture like Vicryl because that has the potential to abrade the cornea. But uh, gut is fine, proline, nylon, any of those would work if they're double armed. Or if you have free needers, needles so you can effectively make them into a double arm suture. Uh, once that tissue is clamped here, I then start at one end and here's my 6 suture, and I just am going to do uh, back and forth, back and forth, right proximal to the clamp. So I'm, my suture's passing just on the, on the inferior edge of that clamp. And I run across the width of the lid. So I put my first pass through here, then I come back out through here. I'm gonna go back in here, come out on this side, go back in here, come out on this side. So I just do a running 
uh, suture across the width of the lid, staying just below the clamp. And you can see here's my chromic, and here's my suture line. The suture line is gonna be just uh, proximal to the clamped tissues. Once I have run from one end to the other end, I just take a 15 blade and I cut off the clamped tissue here. Now, when I do this, it's important that I keep my 15 blade pointed largely toward the ceiling. You don't wanna just, uh, you wanna slowly saw across here. If you uh, try and just make a single cut across, you have a high risk of cutting the suture in which case you then have to go and start over and suture these two rough, raw edges together. But as long as I keep my 15 blade against the superior board of the clamp, and here I have an assistant who's using two Q-tips to pull the lid tissue down, those steps are just intended to make sure that I don't cut this suture that's holding my tissues together. And once I've cut off that tissue, I check to be sure that my suture is still intact. This is just a running suture. It started here, came out here, and I have a needle at either end of it here. I then take that needle and starting on the back side of the eyelid, I go through conjunctiva above my suture line and I exit through the eyelid skin in the area of the lid crease. I do this first on one side, and then I go back and do the same maneuver with the other end of the suture through the temporal, temporal side here. So we've already brought it through on this side and now I'm doing the same thing starting posteriorly and bringing it through full thickness eyelid to exit at about the area of the eyelid crease. Once I have the suture passed through, I'm then going to just tie it on itself on the surface of the, of the skin here. And I leave these little nuts, I just tie it to itself here and to itself there. And this is after I've done this on both sides. My little knot is sitting in the general area of the eyelid crease, one medially, one laterally. I have no knots on the underside of the cornea and I have a monofilament suture and it's at the superior border of tarsus. So I really have not found keratopathy to be a problem doing it this way at all. I have uh, some of my colleagues talk about using a bandage contact lens afterwards. I've honestly never ever had to do that. I have them put a little bit of lubricating ointment in the eye four times a day. They probably don't even need to do that. And uh, we just allow this suture to dissolve away after a week to 10 days. And by that time, the conjunctiva and Mueller's has re-adhered and we're in this case, we're, it's re-adhered eight millimeters uh, closer to the tarsal plate than it started because we've excised that eight millimeters of conjunctiva and Mueller's muscle on both sides. And this is this patient now at, uh, at the end of the procedure, her knots on the surface, and you can see we get good lid height and good contour from the Mullerectomy. So for a, a good function that responds to neosinephrine, uh, that's my preferred approach. If the patient fails to respond to neosinephrine, or if I don't have good function, then instead I will plan to do a levator aponeurosis advancement. I'm gonna take that tendon of the levator muscle, I'm gonna cut it off the anterior surface of tarsus, I'm going to shorten it, and I'm gonna reattach it to tarsal plate. I do this under local anesthesia. I prefer an anterior approach coming through the eyelid crease, and this allows me to sit the patient upright to adjust lid height and contour. Now, when I was initially trained to do this procedure, I was trained to put three sutures in, one medially, one centrally, one laterally. I generally try and get by with just one suture now, uh, centrally. If it's well-placed, I can get a good lid height and contour. Sometimes I'll have to add a second suture if I either have a little medial droop or temporal droop after my first suture to correct the contour. Now, one thing to mention about local anesthesia, local anesthesia can cause uh, several artifacts in TOSA surgery. It can cause uh, the eyelid on the table uh, to be higher than it really will be, and this occurs if the local anesthetic paralyzes orbicularis muscle. 
And if the neosinephrine or the epinephrine, and I use a one to 200,000 mixture of epinephrine, if it stimulates Mueller's muscle, the combination of a paralyzed orbicularis and a stimulated Mueller's may artificially elevate the eyelid. On the other hand, uh, local anesthesia can also cause an artificially low eyelid on the table compared to where it will be when the local anesthetic wears off. This occurs if the local anesthetic uh, diffuses back into the levator muscle and paralyzes it. So if I get paralysis of the levator muscle, then the lid's gonna be artificially low during surgery. Also, if I use a high volume of local anesthetic, the extra weight of that in the tissues here can cause it to be too low. Uh, so consequently, I try to only use about one cc of local anesthetic, and I use a mixture of lidocaine with one to 100,000 epinephrine and uh, marcaine without epinephrine, so I effectively get a concentration of one to uh, 200,000 epinephrine. Uh, I have done this without epinephrine at all in attempt to avoid that Mueller's muscle sympathetic stimulation. The problem with that is you get more bleeding and more bleeding can lead to uh, gravitational weight in the eyelid and make things a little too low. So generally, unless I see somebody who, I, who has undergone a previous repair, which ended up showing uh, an overactive Mueller's muscle, and that would be a patient where I finished their surgery, when they're sitting up, they look perfect, and the next day, or say two hours later, when the epinephrine's worn off, the lid drops back down again. Then if I have to reoperate them, I'll do them without uh, epinephrine. But generally, I like to do uh, epinephrine uh, to prevent bleeding. So here's an example of a anterior levator aponeurosis approach. This is a patient who has a traumatic ptosis. He um, was involved in a motor vehicle accident, had a lot of swelling, and now, this is six months later. If we have a traumatic ptosis, we generally like to wait six months before uh, attempting surgical repair because I have seen traumatic ptosis improve uh, for up to six months or even rarely longer. So if it is improving, I wait until that improvement is plateaued or a minimum of six months time. You can see that this patient also is recruiting the frontalis muscle on this side. There's his eyebrow here compared to this side. Now again, this would be very helpful uh, observation if I were planning to do a frontalis sling where I'm attaching the eyebrow to the eyelid because I know he can raise the eyelid up by raising his eyebrow. I don't need to do that here because he has good levator function. So instead, I'm just going to be shortening the levator aponeurosis and reattaching it. Our approach is to do an eyelid crease incision. We incise through skin and orbicularis. And then we dissect through the layer below beneath skin and orbicularis. The next layer will be the orbital septum. Up above the eyelid crease, below the eyelid crease, the next layer would be the levator aponeurosis. But in this case, the levator aponeurosis is disinserted. You see this straight white edge of tissue here. This is the levator aponeurosis. Normally, it should be down here on the surface of tarsus, but it is pulled and retracted up, causing the lid to droop. So once I identify this free edge, and I do this by incising through skin and orbicularis, and then I open the orbital septum so that orbital fat, preaponeurotic fat can prolapse. I can then retract that and see right beneath the preaponeurotic fat is the levator aponeurosis. I'm then gonna go down and free up the edge of tarsal plate here. So once I've exposed tarsus, it's quite simple for me to suture the free edge of levator aponeurosis to this free surface of tarsus in the eyelid. And the suture I personally prefer for this is a 6-0 nylon. Uh, I don't think it has to be a, a nylon, a nylon, a proline, a gut. Again, I prefer not to use Vicryl or any braided suture because if I happen to inadvertently go full thickness through the tarsal plate, that braided suture, if it's exposed on the back side of palpebral conjunctiva, will definitely cause uh, keratopathy. Uh, even with a full thickness bite with uh, a nylon, even if I go full thickness, I have not found that to cause keratopathy uh, because the monofilament is pretty well tolerated by the cornea. So I pass this suture in a horizontal mattress fashion through the tarsal plate 
And then I'd go up and take a horizontal mattress bite through the levator aponeurosis, and I advance it down and tie it by bringing the aponeurosis back down to the surface of tarsus again. I then want to sit the patient upright and inspect the lid height and contour. This is a patient I just used one suture for, and I'm actually quite pleased with the contour I have, and I'm pleased with the height that I have. Here there is a slight overcorrection. I actually don't generally aim for overcorrection. I like it to be exactly where I want it to be. You will certainly read in textbooks and some other surgeons who purposefully want to overcorrect by one millimeter. Uh, I have found if I do that, I tend to get a persistent overcorrection of one millimeter. So I generally try to make it exactly match the other side. Once I'm happy with the heightened contour, it's quite simple. I just do a running closure of that lid crease incision. Again, in this case, we used uh, a fast absorbing uh, 6.0 gut suture. You can use a proline or nylon. You can use silk. You can use whatever you want in the skin here. And you can see here preoperatively and postoperatively, we have lifted the eyelid up to a symmetrical height and contour to the contralateral side. And the reason we could do this is by Use, doing the patient under local anesthesia, sitting him up, and making sure in the operating room that he matched up well. The other thing I want you to just take a minute to look at is this is his eyebrow preoperatively, and this is his eyebrow postoperatively. So you can see he was automatically recruiting the frontalis muscle here. This is not something he consciously does. This is a brainstem reflex when your superior uh, field is occluded by the eyelid your brain automatically cranks in some extra innervation to the frontalis on that side. And interestingly, it's almost always a unilateral phenomenon. Less than 1% of the time do I see bilateral recruitment in the case of a unilateral ptosis. So it's pretty hard for us to individually raise the eyebrow uh, volitionally, but if it's in response to a droopy eyelid, your brain does that for you. And here after surgery, he's re relaxed that because his brain says, oh, I now have a normal superior visual field on both sides, so I don't have to do that anymore. Again, this is important, as we'll discuss when we talk about frontalis slings here in just a minute. Here's another patient. We did a combination of an upper blepharoplasty, and certainly part of this is a pseudotosis caused by dermatoclasis. But in addition, when we held the dermatoclasis out of the way, he still had an underlying ptosis as well, and this allows us to correct both the dermatoclasis and the ptosis at, in, with one operation. Uh, another patient here, preoperatively and postoperatively, fairly subtle ptosis, but we're able to fine tune this uh, in the fashion that, that we want by doing this under local anesthesia. Uh, again, here's a patient with a fairly mild left upper lid ptosis, but she's maybe got a little higher brow on this side than this side. And in this case, we did bilateral uh, uh, blepharoplasties and a left upper lid levator advancement. Now, the question always comes up, what happens in a patient who has a, a, a herring's uh, response? And here's a patient who uh, had a ptosis on both sides, and, uh, but it was partially disguised by the fact that she was recruiting her brow on this side, and this is after uh, bilateral levator advancement. Now, here's a, a circumstance. This patient has a ptosis, but he also has proptosis. You can see here the globe is more prominent on this side than the opposite side, and in this circumstance, we want to be careful not to overcorrect that eyelid because that's going to cause lid retraction and could cause incomplete closure. So again, it's very helpful to adjust this intraoperatively and put it exactly where we want it to be. Now, uh, this is a patient who had uh, a modest left upper lid ptosis. And at the time of surgery, we corrected that and I made an eyelid crease to match her other side. But postoperatively, she looked great one week post-op, but when she came back three months later, 
she had uh, too much skin here and that lid crease had migrated back down and caused asymmetry. So in that circumstance, we can go back and just do a little upper blepharoplasty on this side to match up the other side and get a good uh, symmetrical cosmetic result. Now, an operation that I really like to use is a quote, small incision ptosis repair. I showed you an example where we make an incision the entire width of, of the eyelid. I'm sorry, let me go back here for a minute. But if I have, and if I'm going to do a blepharoplasty, I have to do that. If it's a congenital ptosis, I want to do that. But if it's an acquired ptosis and the patient has a deep superior sulcus and a high eyelid crease, those patients are particularly good candidates to do a small incision, only about one centimeter right here in the center of the eyelid. And then again, identifying and advancing levator aponeurosis. So here we've just made this small one centimeter wide incision. We peel that open and we remove a little bit of orbicularis here to expose the distal tarsal plate. I pass a suture through the tarsus and then I pass a suture through the levator aponeurosis above and bring that in apposition to the tarsus. And sitting this patient upright, he was a little bit overcorrected here, so we went back and back that suture off a little bit. But you can see uh, through just a one centimeter incision and one stitch, uh, we can get pretty good matching contour and, and height. And this is a little bit uh, simpler than making a full uh, width eyelid incision. Now, the other thing we talked about in the diagnosis of ptosis is the concept of Herring's dependency. And as we all know, Herring's law refers to the fact that yoke muscles receive equal innervation. And the bilateral levator muscles are yoke muscles. You can't really open one eye without opening the other eye. You can close one eye by activating orbicularis, but you can't unilaterally uh, fire off your uh, levator on one side and not on the other. So here's an example of a patient. He had uh, marked left upper eyelid ptosis. When I lifted his left eyelid, however, you can see the opposite eyelid dropped. And the reason is um, when this eyelid is occluding the visual axis, his brain is trying to get it open. It does two things. One is it recruits the frontalis. You can see how the eyebrow is higher on this side than it is on this side. So he's recruiting the frontalis. But in addition, the body turns up the innervation to the levator muscle but it can't do that unilaterally, so it sends extra energy to both levator muscles. We then elevate the totic eyelid, and all of a sudden the brain says, oh, I don't have to try to get it open so hard. And when it stops trying so hard, the opposite eyelid then drops. This is an example of Herring's dependency. And that generally means that we need to do bilateral repair. That patient refused repair on the right side. We showed him the picture and he said, well, just fix the left eye. And, uh, you know, cause I don't, it doesn't bother me that much. But afterwards he said, oh yeah, now I need to get this eyelid fixed. The problem is when we fix this eyelid, now he gets further droop on the contralateral side. So Herring's dependency can really uh, make it uh, difficult to fine tune the ptosis, and generally I like to do both eyelids simultaneously if I can. However, we have seen the occasional patient where they show us evidence of Herring's dependency in the office, but after we do repair on just one side, the opposite eyelid did not drop, and we would not have had to do surgery on the other side. And again, here's an example of a patient droopy eyelid. This is intraoperative adjustment of that lid height and contour to get it to match the other side. Um, but here's another example. This patient had uh, uh, ptosis on this side. We repair the ptosis and the opposite lid drops down. You can see that the MRD here is probably three millimeters or so, and here it's about one and a half millimeters. On the other hand, here's a patient who also shows herring dependency, more totic eyelid here, but we lift that up with a Q-tip and this side drops. Our margin reflex distance here goes from about 
you know, two and a half millimeters down to about a half a millimeter. And yet when we repaired the one side, the opposite side really did not drop. So Herring's dependency is something to be aware of, but it is not universally predictive that the opposite eye will become totic. Here is this patient after just undergoing unilateral repair, and she does not have very significant ptosis on the contralateral side. And just a few more pre-op and post-op examples. Another patient here with acquired ptosis, good function, and he has no lag and down gaze. Uh, in that case, we want to flip the eyelid if they're a soft contact lens where to make sure that they don't have any papillary conjunctivitis because some people will get, uh, you know, a papillary conjunctivitis in response to their soft contact lens. If I see that, I make them stay out of their contact lenses for 90 days, which he did comes back in three months later wearing his glasses, he's still totic, then that tells me he's a candidate for repair. Now the other option we have is when we do this under local anesthesia, we can over or we can purposely undercorrect uh, ptosis height. This is a patient who has bilateral ptosis, but he did not perceive any problem in the right eye. I talked to him about the fact that when we lifted this side, this side might become more apparent, he said, no, just operate on this eyelid. So in his case, we purposefully undercorrected him. I just wanted to get an MRD of about uh, one and a half millimeters on this side in order to match the MRD that he had on the contralateral side. And by sitting him up and making him lower than I normally would have liked to, making him just match the other eye, it allowed me to uh, just do unilateral surgery. And just one more example, again, of this uh, small incision ptosis. Again, a traction suture, that small one centimeter incision, exposing the tarsus place, or in this case, I'm sorry, we spread to expose the levator aponeurosis here. And then we expose the tarsal plate here by excising the pretarsal uh, levator muscle. So once we have tarsus exposed here, Levator exposed up above, we're just going to pass a suture through the tarsus and then through the levator aponeurosis, bringing that back down onto the surface of tarsal plate, and then sitting the patient upright to adjust lid height and contour. And again, this is a little too high, and we're going to want to back that suture off so that we uh, get a better match of the contralateral side. Again, a reminder of the importance of herrings. In this case, we sat this patient upright and she looks like she's overcorrected. But then I took a Q-tip and I lifted the mortotic side on here because now I can see she's raising her eyebrow, tells me she's trying to get this eyelid open. And when I lift this totic eyelid on the left side, the right eyelid relaxes and comes back down to the limbus again because of herrings dependency. Now, the other advantage to intraoperative adjustment of, is that we can take and we can use this procedure to correct contour abnormalities. This patient had just an isolated medial ptosis. Her eyelid, you know, laterally, say from the lateral limbus over is fine. So in this case, I'm just gonna advance levator aponeurosis here medially. And when I do that and sit her up, I can see that I've got a nice, correction of lid height with one suture placed here, there was no need to do correction across the board there. It also allows me to adjust the contour of the eyelid. This is a patient with a right upper lid ptosis, and you can see she's got a bit of a temporal flare to her normal eyelid. Normally we expect the high point of the lid to be just nasal to the pupil, but in this case we can see she's actually got a little bit of temporal flare there but I can match that in this eyelid by moving my sutures laterally and trying to get greater elevation here than I had medially. When I sat her up, this allowed me to get a pretty good uh, match of the temporal peak in both eyes. So again, one final look here at the mulerectomy. 
And this is a good candidate for that. She's got a preoperative ptosis. We put a drop of 2.5% neosinephrine in her left eye, and five minutes later, the lid comes at a good height. So we're going to go ahead and measure four millimeters from the superior border of tarsus up into the superior fornix. And we're going to place, in this case, I'm showing you how we can do this with two hemostats. So if you don't have a fancy clamp, you can still do this procedure. Uh, we take two straight hemostats and clamp uh, this eight millimeters of tissue, four millimeters up and four millimeters back down, do our running suture just below it, and then cut it off. And this gives us a good lid height and contour as well. Now, if we do do a levator aponeurosis advancement, one advantage is we can do a little fine tuning of this even at one week postoperatively. Here's a patient preoperatively and one week postop. Obviously, when I sat her up in surgery, I did not want to overcorrect this side. I thought it matched the other side quite nicely, but at one week, she's overcorrected. Well, I can do something about that. In this case, we take her uh, into the minor surgery room, put a little local anesthetic in, and we can just grasp the wound and peel it apart here. And I can re-expose the tarsal plate here. And I find the suture where I've advanced levator aponeurosis. And I can cut the suture and let the levator recess there. And here she is at the end of that little minor room procedure where I've released that suture here. And then I suture the skin back together. And here she is one week postoperatively with good symmetry of lid height and contour. So it is possible for me to fine tune a levator advancement. Another example, this patient has poor contour with a definite peak here on this side on the left upper lid. And this is after releasing that in the left upper lid in the mine room. And this gives us pretty good symmetry, but she still does have a little bit of right upper lid over correction. Okay, so those are our approaches for patients who have good levator function or have uh, you know, intermediate levator function. If they have good levator function and they respond well to neosinephrine, we do the mulerectomy and we can do that with the clamp or with the two hemostats. If on the other hand, the neosinephrine test is not good or if they have decreased levator function less than 12 millimeters, uh, we do the levator advancement. Now we're going to talk about patients with poor levator function. Patients with poor levator function generally have this either because there's a problem with the muscle itself, and we talked about this two weeks ago. They could have chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. They could have uh, congenital ptosis with a localized muscular dystrophy, uh, or patients who have uh, a nerve problem, like a third nerve problem, where they're getting inadequate innervation to that muscle. In those cases, it's not going to work to try and tighten or, it, or shorten the levator muscle. Instead, we have to bypass that levator muscle. And this is where we like to do a frontalis sling. And the approach I use, I do this through an open lid crease. There are some people who will just do stab incisions, but I'll show you why I think that an open lid crease is preferable in my mind. And I suture the sling directly onto the tarsal plate. This allows me to adjust the lid contour with these tarsal sutures and then I adjust the height of the eyelid by how much tension I tighten my sling at my brow incision. And again, the way this operation works is to make this reflexive frontalis recruitment more efficient. Here's an example of a patient who's trying to open this right eyelid and she's doing a pretty good job of it. She's only got about a millimeter of ptosis here, but you can see her eyebrow is way up on this side compared to the other side. And when we block her eyebrow, you can see she's got a pretty profound ptosis. The whole concept in the sling is to attach the tarsal plate to the frontalis so we get a one-to-one -one transmission of force. Right now, I don't have a one-to-one -one transmission of force. I have to raise my eyebrow about a centimeter to get a one millimeter elevation of the lid height. So a frontalis sling will make that uh, a much more direct transfer. Now, interestingly, this is a patient I saw uh, recently who'd figured this out and he did his own frontalis sling. He actually came in and he had uh, 
acute onset of uh, myasthenia with a poor function ptosis. But he'd already figured out if he put a piece of uh, Band-Aid to the eyelid and to his forehead, he could lift the lid better than if he, uh, if he didn't have that there. So he's got kind of got the concept of a frontalis sling down. And again, this just allows this to be more efficient. Here's a patient who has a uh, ptosis and he's got marked frontalis recruitment here. But even with that marked recruitment, he only gets that lid open about a millimeter or so. This is after we do a frontalis sling. This has just allowed him to have pretty good symmetry between the two sides. He can relax his eyebrow. His eyebrow here is about the same height as the other eye, and he can use this to more efficiently lift the eyelid. Now, we have a number of different options for uh, surgical materials to do a frontalis sling. Uh, probably the gold standard is to use autogenous fascia to harvest that from the, uh, from the iliotibial tract. However, uh, we have to have a patient who's probably four or five years of age, and if they get much older than that, they don't want to have this done. If they're much younger than that, we can't really get a good fascial strip. Uh, we can use donor fascia. We can use Gore-Tex, either Gore-Tex suture or Gore-Tex patch, which we can cut into strips. Supermid, uh, mercelene mesh, proline sutures. Uh, some people talk about using the frontalis muscle itself as sling material, I'm not uh, wild about that. But here's an example of this operation in a very young patient. This patient is only a month old, but she's got a pretty profound left ptosis. But the good news is she's still trying to use that eyelid. She's kind of raising her eyebrow here. So we're gonna make an eyelid crease incision here, and we're gonna mark three points in the brow. Some people will take this point and mark it up here over the, uh, uh, front uh, higher up above the, the brow. There's no need to do that. You can keep these little incisions at the brow. And we're going to open this lid crease incision and expose the tarsal plate. We're going to make stab incisions medially, centrally, and temporally. In this case, I'm using a super mid, I, I misspoke, a Gore-Tex uh, patch material, which I cut into a strip, a strip, and then I can suture it to the surface of tarsus. I suture this with mercelene suture, 5 o mercelene, but you have to be very, very careful not to get a full thickness pass through the cornea because if you do, you will definitely cause keratopathy. So in this case, <clears throat> I flip the eyelid over after I pass these sutures to make sure there's nothing exposed on the conjunctival surface. And then we, after we've sutured this to tarsus, we can use a right needle or a free abdominal needle or even you can... Uh, make a tract with a scissors and pass a hemostat down here to pull the sling material up through your temporal brow incision and your nasal brow incision. And this allows me to then look at the contour that I have. And if I'm pleased with the contour, I then bring these two pieces of the sling together to that central stab incision. And I tie the sling, trying to lift the eyelid up as high as I can and I want to get it up as close to the superior limbus as possible. And then I bury this, I leave these ends long enough so that if I have to go back and untie and lower it, uh, I'm still able to find it uh, you know, for a month to six weeks after surgery. So I can go back and adjust this, or even uh, years later, it's possible to find this and untie it and relax it. Or if my sling is too low, I can untie it and and make uh, more tension, make a, a, a tighter uh, junction there. And here is this patient one week postoperatively. You can see that she's using her brow. She can get the lid open. We have good height and contour. And because I opened the lid crease and reformed the lid crease, I get good symmetry of my eyelid creases. And this is this patient now, six months uh, postoperatively, you can see these brow incisions heal almost to the point of imperception, and we maintain a good lid height and contour. Another example of a patient, she has very little levator function here, but she has good brow recruitment. She's trying to elevate this uh, lid by uh, stimulating her frontalis on that side. And this is her after a Gore-Tex sling. You can see that she now, with very subtle brow movement, she can get the eyelid to open, and by relaxing that brow, she gets it to close. So uh, I do like slings if patients will recruit their frontalis. 
Another example where a sling is important, this is a patient who has a congenital right third nerve palsy, and you can see he has a ptosis here, but he has aberrant functioning. He gets uh, crosstalk between the medial rectus and the levator, so when he adducts his eye, the lid comes up to a normal height. Well, I can't do a levator advancement because this would be all over the place as he looks from right to left. So instead we go in and we disinsert the levator muscle. I sutured uh, the levator to the uh, periosteum up at the orbital rim to keep it from reattaching to the eyelid. And then we do a, a frontalis sling. And again, he can open it by raising the eyebrow gently. He can close it by relaxing the eyebrow gently. And this gives us good height and contour. And this is an example of a patient who was undercorrected after his initial surgery. I'm able to go ahead and open this incision here, find my knot, untie it, and tighten it up, and again, sit him up until I have good uh, height and contour. So I can adjust this postoperatively. Uh, here's a little patient with, after her initial sling, she has bad contour. We can then go through the eyelid crease and we can uh, tighten the sling to the temple tarsus here to give us a better uh, contour on each side. Uh, another patient with bilateral third nerve palsies, and this was kind of wild. When she would look to the right, uh, her right eye would close and her left eyelid would open. When she looked to the left, her left eye would close and her left uh, and her right lid would open. But we can see she's trying still to get that eye open. You can see she's recruiting her frontalis on this side when she looks this direction. She's recruiting her frontalis on this side when she looks in this direction. So she's going to be a very good candidate to do a bilateral uh, uh, sling. We again disinsert the levator first and then we go in and do bilateral slings. She can open well, she can close well. Now, the question always comes up, should you do a unilateral sling in unilateral congenital ptosis or bilateral slings? Uh, my bias is to just do a unilateral sling and I'll show you why. This is uh, a patient with unilateral ptosis. She's trying to get the eye open so I know the sling should work well for her, but she doesn't have very good levator function. Now, I can get very good symmetry in primary position if I do a unilateral sling. The one disadvantage is in down gaze, they're gonna have some lid lag. Now that lid lag does get better over time, but I can see that this lid is overcorrected. So uh, on the other hand, this is a patient after bilateral slings, uh, he has better he, you know, symmetry in down gaze, but you really don't spend your time interacting with the public by looking down at your shoes. You're looking straight ahead. And in that case, this is usually not very apparent. Uh, what I tell parents is I tell them, listen, if you decide that you would want to uh, have me come back and do the second eye later on, I can do it. Uh, but let's just operate on the one side first and see what's, you know, see what you think. But I have never had a parent come back uh, and ask me to do the second side. So uh, I generally do one side. The reason that I really um, prefer to do one side, the very first case I did, I guess I was trained to treat unilateral congenital ptosis with poor function to treat that with bilateral slings. The very first patient I did that on ended up with exposure keratopathy and a corneal ulcer on her good side, the side that had had no ptosis preoperatively. And I said, mm, I don't like that. So I've been doing unilateral slings and have had very good patient acceptance. Again, here's a patient preoperatively. Uh, this is where I want to adjust him at the time of surgery. I reform the eyelid crease and we get you know good elevation and good symmetry postoperatively with good closure. Now, as I said, the one down, uh, downside is down gaze. All right, so what do we do with a patient with poor function ptosis, but no, um, no um, recruitment of the brow? In that case, we have to do a uh, frontalis sling. Uh, I, I misspoke, a, a super maximal levator resection because we can't do uh, a frontalis sling. Now, this 
does result, it can lift the eyelid well, but it results in more lag ophthalmos. So if a patient has no Bell's uh, reflex, I don't want to use this. And we cannot use it if there's aberrant innervation of the levator, like a Marcus gun or congenital third nerve, because we'll just exacerbate that. So here's an example of a patient. He has uh, decreased ptosis, but he's not really recruiting the, the frontalis, no re frontalis recruitment on this side. And uh, in this case, uh, he has a good Bell's phenomenon. I'm going to have to go ahead and try and do a levator resection instead. We make a skin incision through skin and orbicularis. We're going to open the orbital septum, and then we're going to uh, expose the preaponeurotic fat, which is just behind the septum. After I've done that, I disinsert the levator aponeurosis from the tarsal plate, and then I want to pull it forward. And here's Whitnall's ligament now that I'm looking at. I'm going to pull it forward to expose as much of it as I can. And I make a cut through Whitnall's on this side and a cut on this side. And that allows me to advance uh, as much levator muscle as possible. You can see here's the superior fornix. And we can see conjunctiva over the cornea here. And then I'm going to amputate all of this levator aponeurosis, levator muscle, and I'm going to suture this edge to the superior border of tarsus here. And we're going even higher now. Here you can see where we have the actual fatally infiltrated levator muscle. And in this case, I'm taking about 25 millimeters of levator muscle and I'm going to amputate it. First, I pre-pass sutures through it. And then I suture to tarsal plate. And you can see this gives me a pretty good lid height and contour. And then I cut off all the levator muscle that uh, I resected. And here's this same patient preoperatively. And this is after surgery. He has good height. He has some leg ophthalmos, but he can tolerate this reasonably well. Another example, this little girl, decreased levator function, but she doesn't really recruit her frontalis on this side. And this is after a unilateral levator uh, supermaximum resection. Now, you can get overcorrection with these patients. Over time, however, I generally want to get overcorrection because over time it will tend to drop, as we can see here. So a little bit of overcorrection early on is not bad. Undercorrection does not generally get better and usually means we have to go back and do a reoperation. So again, the large majority of ptosis is going to be levator aponeurotic, in which case we do an aponeurotic advancement. Uh, if there's good levator function, uh, we can either do aponeurotic advancement or mulorectomy. If there's poor or aberrant function, we either have to do a frontalis sling or a supermaximal levator resection. So uh, that is a, a summary of the um, options we have for ptosis repair. And at this point, I think I'm going to take a look and see what, uh, what questions uh, uh, our, our audience may have about this, about ptosis uh, repair. One question that was uh, posed two weeks ago was whether or not uh, to use a frost suture, a suture through the lower eyelid and tape it to the eyebrow. I don't do that. Uh, all you need to do is have the patient's uh, family make sure that they vigorously lubricate the eye, even if it's wide open. If they vigorously lubricate uh, every two to three hours, uh, I've never had a patient develop a corneal ulcer afterwards. And uh, trying to see that patient back postoperatively and get that frost suture out again is, is, a, is a real hassle. So uh, I don't use frost sutures. Um, so at this point, uh, see if there are any uh, other questions that any of our, our uh, participants might have. They're telling me I still have no open questions. Okay, now I have a question. Do you intraoperatively adjust the lid position depending on the pre-op 
uh, leave aid or action. Yes, I thank you for asking that. Yes, for sure. If I have a patient who has poor leave aid or function, I will try to overcorrect them because I know that they're going to tend to drop some. Uh, if I have patients with good leave aid or function, I want to leave them under local anesthesia again. This is talking about doing this under local anesthesia. I'll leave them right where I want them to be. But if they have poor leave aid or function and I'm doing it under leave aid or I'm under local anesthesia, I will try and overcorrect them. Uh, second question is, what is my experience with Palmer tendon? The answer is, I have no experience with Palmer tendon. Uh, I actually uh, imagine it would work fine, but I have never found a, a need for it because it's so easy for me to harvest uh, fascia uh, from the uh, iliotibial tract. So fascia lata works, I think, uh, the same. Next question, what are the, what are the Fascinella Servat procedure? Um, I tend to use mulerectomy instead of Fascinella Servat, but it's almost the same operation. The only difference in a Fascinella Servat, you're resecting uh, a little bit of the superior tarsus and a little bit of the distal uh, levator, uh, aperos, mulars, and conjunctiva. Uh, so I tend to leave the, the tarsus alone and tend to just... Uh, do a mulerectomy myself. Okay, so uh, the next question is, operating on Marcus Gunjawink, we certainly do do that. Uh, what is the indication? About the same as anything else, and that is early on, if it's threatening, uh, if, if it's threatening uh, amblyopia, I definitely want to operate it because I have to do a frontalis sling. I have to go in, I'll disinsert the levator muscle, and I will suture it to the supraorbital rim inside the orbit. The only reason I suture it up there is to make sure it doesn't reattach to the eyelid. And then I will do a frontalis sling. If the patient has amblyopia, it's really difficult because anything I do to try and strengthen the levator is going to make the wink worse. Now, if I have a patient where the ptosis is more prominent and the wink isn't too bad, I can do a levator aponeurotic surgery on those patients and just tell them, because most patients do learn to control the, the jaw movements which lead to a wink uh, as they get older. Um, if the patient is not amblyopic, then you can wait until they're old enough to harvest the, uh, the, um, uh, the lateral rectus, um, I misspoke, the, the, uh, the fascia lata. Um, is Berg's table good for interoperative lid positioning and general anesthesia? You know, I think that's probably is a good thing. I generally go in with an idea of where I want the lid to be at the end of the procedure. If they have good levator function, I'd like to have it sort of splitting the pupil. If it's intermediate, I want it sort of halfway between the superior limbus and the pupil. If it's poor function, I want it at or above the superior limbus. But I think Berg's table is, is a good uh, thing as well. Okay, parents often ask when full lid closure will be achieved at bedtime? My answer is maybe never, uh, but it almost always gets quite a bit better uh, after, after six weeks uh, or so. So I generally tell them for the first six weeks, almost everybody needs ointment at bedtime. And after that, most kids can, uh, it, most kids can uh, taper off, uh, off the, uh, the lubricating ointment at six weeks. Okay, well, I think uh, I don't see any more questions in the queue here. Um, aha, another one. Do you do conjunctival approach levator resections? The answer is no. Uh, I really see, in my mind, no advantage to a conjunctival approach over a lid crease approach. I think it's, it's the anatomy's not as clear, so I don't do that. Now, my good friend, Richard Collin, uh, I think still does do a posterior approach. I would say here in North America, 98% uh, of oculoplastic surgeons will do a uh, anterior approach through a lid crease rather than through a conjunctival approach. And it also gives us the advancer, uh, advantage of getting uh, 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 reestablishing re the eyelid crease. Okay, how did you manage blepharophimosis syndrome? Uh, that can be difficult for sure. In congenital eyelid syndrome, we have telecanthus, we have epicanthus inversus, and ptosis. 
Uh, as a general rule of thumb, we have to correct the ptosis earlier, especially if it's amblyogenic or if we think there's a risk of torticollis because of neck position. But we don't have to correct the epicanthus until they're quite a bit older. And definitely as these kids grow, the epicanthus tends to get better. Uh, if you want to really correct the epicanthus, in my opinion, opinion uh, you really have to do transnasal wiring. So uh, the, the soft tissue, I just do with a little uh, V to Y advancement in the medial canthus, but I do transnasal wiring to bring the medial canthus uh, close together. And I usually wait until they're 10 or 12 years of age to do that. Uh, next question is, is there an indication for Facinella cervat? Now, instead of conjunctival mulorectomy, in my hands, I just do the conjunctival mulorectomy. Uh, I would have no argument at all if somebody wanted to do, you know, a Facinella cervat for a modest congenital ptosis or a good function, modest um, uh, acquired ptosis. I just think the neosinephrine test allows me to titrate things a little bit better than the Facinella cervat. Okay, well, I think our hour uh, it has come to an end. I hope this was, uh, was helpful. And if there are additional questions, we can uh, take those uh, offline. So uh, thank you for your attention. And Oh, wait, last thing. How do you adjust the lip position under general anesthesia in resurgeries? Well, the only time I would do general anesthesia is if it were a kid, okay? Anybody who can be done under... Uh, local anesthesia, I always do under local anesthesia because it's so much easier for me to adjust lid height and contour with them sitting upright. If it's a child, I generally uh, want to get it higher than it was. And uh, that means, you know, if it's poor function, I want to get it up at the superior limbus under general anesthesia. Okay, folks, um, I think I will uh, say goodnight to everyone and I uh, appreciate your attention. Bye now.